From the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. Of the four COVID vaccines approved by Health Canada rolling out across the country right now, which one is the best vaccine? The thing is, even the idea of a quote-unquote best vaccine isn't the most accurate way to look at this, according to public health experts and doctors. Here's Canada's chief medical advisor, Dr. Supriya Sharma. We're starting to see a little bit of a narrative of good vaccines and bad vaccines. There really isn't that sort of delineation. You've probably heard of the term vaccine efficacy. It's often the first thing news reports mention when a new vaccine gets approved. Some shots, like Pfizer, are rated at 95% efficacy. Others like Johnson & Johnson's clock in at 67% efficacy. Higher number, better vaccine, right? Not exactly. I know it's confusing, but we'll get into why and how vaccine trials get those numbers in just a moment. To help explain, we're joined by Dr. Suman Chakrabarty, infectious disease doctor at Trillium Health Partners. He'll break down the real differences between the vaccines and why the answer to the question of what's the best vaccine is both more complicated and much simpler than you might think. Dr. Chakrabarty, thanks for your time and thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. The term vaccine efficacy is one we're hearing a lot about, especially in how people are comparing the different vaccines to one another. So let's start there, because there seems to be some confusion over what vaccine efficacy actually means. Can you help define it for us? Yeah, I got to be honest with you. Even sometimes when I used to look at the definition, learning about this in university and med school, it can be confusing. But the way that I put it is, so you take two groups, groups that got the vaccine who are being compared to a group that didn't get the vaccine. You look at the rate of infection in one group versus the other. Then what you can do is that you compare them and you look at the percent reduction of the risk. So for example, let's say if you have the vaccine group has an 80% risk of getting COVID without any vaccine, and then you got the other group, the vaccinated group, they now have a 20% risk of getting COVID. You then can take that and express it as a percentage, as a 60% reduction, and then you, you express that as a percentage, and that's how you get your number. The point is, though, you're just looking to see that reduction in risk, and that's the main idea behind vaccine efficacy. Right. So that number, that percentage is weighed by a group that is vaccinated versus a group that is not vaccinated. What it doesn't mean is that if a vaccine has, let's say, I don't know, 60 percent efficacy, it doesn't mean that you have 40 percent chance of getting sick. That's exactly right. And, you know, that's a really tough thing to get your head around because that's, I think, a lot of what people are thinking. It just basically looks at how much protection you get versus somebody who doesn't have the vaccine. And I know 60% sounds low, but this is actually in terms of vaccine efficacy, this is actually a really, really good number. I've also heard epidemiologists say that efficacy is a snapshot almost of the period that the vaccine was in trial. Is that accurate to say that it reflects when it was in trial and the information we have at that point? That's very right. And this is actually a crucial point for looking at the vaccines that we have right now. We have four that are available in Canada at the time of this recording. We have to remember that it's like comparing apples and oranges if you look at just the vaccine rates. For example, the amount of variants that were around, how much COVID was around to begin with. For example, with the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, the trial was done at a time when there was a lot of COVID in the areas that they were doing it, not so much with Pfizer and Moderna. These types of things can really, really influence the results of a trial. And that's why it's important for us to look at them on a level playing field. What do they do for preventing death and hospitalization? And all four of these vaccines are extremely effective at reducing death and hospitalization. As medical officer of health, I can promise you I am immersed in information about the vaccines. Let me say as plainly as possible that when it's my turn for a vaccine, I would happily receive any of the four with complete confidence. Let's talk about the vaccines that are approved by Health Canada. And as you said, there are four of them, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca. Let's begin first with Moderna and Pfizer. What should we know about these vaccines? How are they similar to one another? So Moderna and Pfizer were the first two that we had approved. And yeah, they have pretty impressive efficacy rate above 90%. But again, we have to kind of take that into context with what time the vaccines were done. And also, again, they're very effective at reducing death and hospitalization. So what the vaccines do, that these are vaccines that are the new category called mRNA vaccines. The long and short of it is you have a little fat particle that delivers genetic material to your cells, 
which is kind of like a soggy IKEA instruction manual. All right. Your cells look at that and the instruction manual allows them to make spike proteins, which are found on the surface of the COVID virus. When you see that, you can actually make an immune response to the spike protein without getting sick from COVID. So then what happens if your body is then subsequently exposed to COVID virus, you can mount an immune response and get rid of it. So you either don't get sick at all, or if you do get sick, it's very, very mild. And that's a very, very big part about reducing the morbidity of COVID and getting past this pandemic. And what about the newer ones, Johnson and Johnson? Johnson and AstraZeneca. Johnson and Johnson was kind of heralded. It was called a bit of a game changer because it's a one shot vaccine, which obviously reduces barriers for some people. How are they similar? And maybe how are they different? Yeah, I agree. And, and the thing is, it's interesting is they also take advantage of the idea of, you know, giving instructions to yourself. It's done in a little bit of a different way. So the other ones used a fat particle to deliver RNA, but the Johnson and Johnson AstraZeneca, they use a virus. It's an altered virus, an adenovirus, cold virus that's unable to cause disease in a human. This virus virus contains DNA inside, like a DNA package, which it then delivers to your cell. Your cell converts the DNA to RNA, which already sounds familiar. And then that's the instruction for you, which to make spike proteins. And then after that, it's the same mechanism. You mount a response, an immune response to the spike proteins without getting sick from COVID. And that way, when COVID is exposed to you, you're not getting sick from it. You can actually clear it. And if you do get sick, it's very mild. One thing about Johnson & Johnson that sets it apart from the other three vaccines, it is only one dose. And I do think this is going to end up being the workhorse vaccine for the world because you really reduce a lot of logistical issues by having one dose. But again, all of these vaccines are extremely effective at preventing death and hospitalization. And that's why these are our ticket out of the pandemic. We'll be right back. I wanted to quickly mention a little bit about the AstraZeneca shot because recently it's gotten a lot of media attention for not exactly the best reasons because, you know, as many as eight European countries briefly suspended rolling out the AstraZeneca shot. Can you sort of explain just a little bit around the concerns about it and how some of the information spread more quickly than almost the hard logistical facts about how this vaccine actually works? Yeah, you know, I think with this, we can even take a step right back to when the data on AstraZeneca was released. And already, you know, this idea of efficacy, this number being lower, you know, if you didn't know much more looking at this, oh, it seems like it's an inferior vaccine, but for the reasons we mentioned before, it's not, it's still quite effective. And the other thing is that, you know, already, I almost think that the well is poisoned from the beginning that anything that happened to the vaccine afterwards was now being looked at with a fine tooth comb. So then what we saw, what happened in Europe was that they saw a number of clots happen, not just any clot. It was a clot that was happening in the brain. It's called a cerebrosinus thrombosis. And it's important to remember that when any type of medication or treatment is rolled out, things are going to happen. People are going to get sick. People are going to die. People are going to have accidents. But it's important to remember this stuff might have happened anyway, even without the vaccine. So you have to kind of look and go, look, are these events happening because of the vaccine or would they have happened anyway? How does this compare to the background rate? And after a review from Health Canada, from EMA in Europe, that's their equivalent, they found that there was no increased risk of this. And the other thing is it's very highly outweighed by the benefit as well as the risks of COVID. The other thing that I want to point to people is that over 11 million or so doses have been given in the UK. Right. Yeah, that's been rolled out a ton in the UK. So the Oxford jab is safe and the Pfizer jab is safe. The thing that isn't safe is catching COVID, which is why it's so important that we all get our jabs as soon as our turn comes. And as it happens, I'm getting mine tomorrow. And the center where I'm getting jabbed is currently using the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Yeah, and that's real world evidence showing that this is safe and effective. We're already seeing the benefits of it, what's happening in the UK. So I think that it's very important for us to have this vigilance once a uh, vaccine is rolled out. But let's put this into perspective. You have a tiny risk compared to the huge benefit of getting vaccinated, as well as the risk of getting COVID itself, which is several times higher. So now that we understand vaccine efficacy and how each vaccine is different, is it then fair to compare them based off of efficacy percentages? And I mean, it's completely understandable that the public does look at those numbers, but it almost seems to miss the focus of what the numbers actually tell us. That's exactly right. And again, because of exactly what you mentioned. So for example, let's say a vaccine that's 60% efficacious. That doesn't mean that 40% of people get COVID. It's a different metric. And that's why I always try to put things on a level playing field. And I keep harping on this death and hospitalization, right? 
If you look at AstraZeneca in the trial, the people who were getting COVID in the trial, it was relatively mild. It was not hospitalizing you and it certainly wasn't killing you. So if you now have a vaccine that takes COVID, which we know can cause severe disease, and it's now turning it into something that, you know, maybe you're in bed with fever for a day, maybe you have a sore throat. I think that's an amazing trade-off. And what we know is all four of these vaccines do that. And that, like I said, is our pathway out of this horrible pandemic. Right. So it's important to remember that none of the vaccinated people have died from COVID, that the vaccine is working. It's absolutely working. And let's say, okay, you can say, well, we have the theoretical thing in the trial. Well, look what we're seeing in Israel. Look what we're seeing in Scotland, in England. And we're going to be getting more data as well. Even in the US, you're seeing that the efficacy of the vaccine and the number of cases dropping all over, it's working. And this is, I think, amazing to see in real time. So this makes me wonder then, is the most important number almost... Zero percent. And what I mean by that is whether a vaccine has 62 percent efficacy or 95 percent efficacy, both of those vaccines are still better than not being vaccinated at all. That's absolutely, I think, the magic point here. And to be honest with you, looking at the two different groups, clinically, meaning what's happening in real life, it doesn't really make much of a difference. As long as you're not in hospital, sick, which we know, by the way, even being in hospital for four days can be a very, very big impact on someone's life. And of course, not dying. I think that what we all want here is to be able to go back to our old lives, you know, pre-pandemic. And one of the big things, this is why hospitalization is so important, is that if you are significantly going to drop hospitalization, hospitalization with vaccination, well, then you don't need to restrict the community anymore. And I think at some point that's going to be our reality. It's coming up soon. We still have a bit more work to do to get there, but I think that's a big goal and that's our exit strategy from this phase of the pandemic. That turns it from potentially a pandemic into an illness still for sure, but a much more manageable one. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we know that, look, when you get COVID and you get severely ill, you can be on oxygen, you can be on a ventilator, you can get blood clots, lots of things that can happen. And if you're taking that and reducing it to a sore throat or a fever for a day or two, I'll take that any day of the week. A big cause for worry now among doctors, among public health officials, epidemiologists like yourself is the spread of the COVID variants. Do we know how they impact the vaccines yet? Absolutely. So we do see that efficacy of COVID vaccine, especially from the trials, has dropped somewhat in areas where there has been COVID variants. But let's remember one thing, even in those situations, for most situations, you're still not getting severe disease causing hospitalization and death. What this does mean, though, we are seeing that the amount of neutralizing antibody that you're making in in some of the experiments that have been looking at this is less. So in the future, I do suspect that we're going to require a booster shot, just like we do with influenza. You know, the virus changes. But I think that overall, you know, the vaccines are still going to work against COVID, still going to prevent death and hospitalization, but we may have to pivot at some point in the future with further booster doses. Right, that researchers are still learning more things about the vaccines themselves, how they interact, because you brought up an interesting point earlier that there's obviously trial data and then there's real world data because millions of people around the world now are getting vaccinated with different shots. And so does that also provide us with maybe more information as time goes on? Because we're seeing what it's actually like when people get the jab. Absolutely. And, you know, when you're looking at this real world data, it adds to the trial data, but it kind of really, really increases our understanding of what's going on. I have to tell you that looking at the way the vaccine is rolled out, I'll give you just like in the UK, you're actually seeing something that you've seen in trial conditions, which are very good conditions that the patients tend to be healthier. It's easier to do follow up. When you're seeing something actually happening in real life, that is such a big thing. It's such a relieving thing to see for me that it's actually working in real life. But that said, you know, we have to remember that it's not going to be perfect all the time. But as long as we're kind of really reducing the risk of severe outcomes, I think that overall is going to be a huge thing for us in the trajectory of the pandemic. We've reached this point in the pandemic where, much like the first part of the pandemic, you know, we're all trying to figure out how best do we protect ourselves and our families. And I know it can be so confusing. I know it's confusing for me too, because there's so many numbers and statistics flying around. As an infectious disease expert, if there is one thing a listener should know about vaccine efficacy and even the concept of, you know, a so-called best vaccine, what should that be? So I think the message that I, and I have been trying to put out this message is that we want to look away from just the numbers, like data on a page and look what is important for us in our real lives. 
I think that everybody agrees that being in a hospital or dying from a disease is bad. And also what's important to us is kind of getting back to our level of normalcy where we're able to hug our family, go out to a restaurant, you know, get a haircut without feeling guilty, you know, these types of things. And these vaccines are part of our pathway back there. When you start to have hospitalizations significantly reducing, death reducing. And if you do get sick, it's mild. These are the things I think that are most important clinically, most important in our real lives. And that's going to be given to us once vaccination is widespread, regardless of which vaccine. Down the road, you know, we might find that certain populations that are at risk might require a certain vaccination. We might be having some changes in our vaccine schedule. We might find that one vaccination of something is better for certain populations. But for right now in the public health emergency, when our goal is to get out of the pandemic, widespread vaccination is going to be our answer to that. And that can be done with any of the four vaccines right now that we have approved in Canada. Right. So the best vaccine then is any vaccine you can get right now. Yeah, I was saying the answer is in our hands. We just need to get it into our arms. The vaccine that works the best, the one that's in your arm. Dr. Jack Rabadi, thank you so much for your expertise on this and for helping explain it. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. Take care. And that is Dr. Suman Chakrabarty, infectious disease doctor at Trulium Health Partners. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Chung, Sabah Aitazaz, and Raju Muthar. Produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.